uh, a lot on. Um, I've also been involved a lot in uh, efforts to uh, limit uh, police activity in our locale environment. So removing police from schools, um, arguing against a new jail, arguments against uh, thank, body cameras. Thank you. Uh, uh, and Philip Cole, would you please introduce yourself? Yes, good morning. Uh, my name is Philip Cole, and I am a member of the San Francisco branch, and also an at-large uh, member of the board of directors of Wolf on the National Section. Thank you. Uh, that's important. Uh, so Philip Cole, Pastor Vaughn, is also a member of the national board. Uh, so we have two national board members here. Uh, uh, Robin Loy, please introduce yourself, Robin. I can't hear you, Robin. You got to unmute yourself. Okay, there. Uh, yeah, Robin Lloyd, Burlington, Vermont, uh, Wilf, and um, Pastor John, I know you from a distance, I guess, from Peace Development Fund, so good to see you here. It's good to see you again, Robin. <laughs> uh, well, Evan Lamb, could you come get in the photo? Uh, one last person, Eva. Uh, Hello, my name is Etta Lamb. Uh, let me undo my video. Okay, so just lean in. Hello, my name is Etta Lamb, and I'm a member of the Fannilou Hamer uh, branch in Columbus, Georgia. And I'm a SARNS board member and also the reading coach for the SPICE program. Thank you, Etta. Uh, and so, Pastor Vaughn, uh, the idea is that you will speak uh, for 10 minutes and tell us uh, about the work of the Ebenezer Church in that wonderful conference uh, that took place in 2019 uh, uh, and where we're going from there. Uh, for the conference in January of 2023. So the floor is yours for 10 minutes. George Friday will give you a five minute sign when you talk for five minutes and then she'll give you the two minute warning. Uh, so pastor, it's on you. Well, thank you, Teresa. And I hope I don't even need all the 10 minutes, but um... As I've been joking with my colleagues, maybe it's an Episcopalian 10 minutes versus a Baptist 10 minutes. But um, so I have uh, been the executive pastor at Ebenezer Baptist Church uh, for a little over two years. And before that, I served as the executive vice president at Auburn Seminary in New York. And in my previous life, actually, where I met first met Robin Lloyd, I was I worked in the field of philanthropy. Um, the multi faith initiative to end mass incarceration really was started um, by Pastor Warnock. Um, this was in 2018. He had had a conversation with my then boss at Auburn Seminary about this idea of a conference that would begin to catalyze the faith voice. There are oftentimes there's work happening in faith communities around mass incarceration, but oftentimes it's not in a very cohesive, strategic, focused way. And so my boss came back, had a conversation with me. I took the lead for Auburn working with Ebenezer. And then we pulled in the temple, which is kind of the large one of the largest Jewish congregate, oldest Jewish congregations here in Atlanta. And we started a planning process. It became clear to us pretty quickly that this needed to be more than a conference. We needed to use this as a chance to really launch an effort to deepen the engagement of faith communities, but also continue to center the voices and experiences of those that have been directly impacted by mass incarceration. And so 
that's been a central part of both the planning and the implementation. In June 2019, we did um, we held this conference called Let My People Go. And you know, we thought we'd get a couple hundred people for the conference. We got over a thousand people who came. You know, we were at Ebenezer. What was interesting, and I think what was um, imp what was important about it was the cross section of people that were present. So it were it was faith communities, but it was also people who were directly impacted, families, people who had been formerly incarcerated, some who were unfairly incarcerated, some who, as they said, I did the crime. And I've done my time. You know, we had judges, lawyers, prosecutors, some business folks, nonprofit partners. It was a real cross section of people um, because we feel that this issue of ma ending mass incarceration is one of those that it actually crosses theological divides, it crosses political divides in terms of some of the partners, you know, some of the conversation partners we've had. And so coming out of that conference, we, we identified three areas that were important to us. One was to increase the engagement of congregations around this work. So if you were doing it, how did you up your game? If you weren't doing it, how did you get involved? Secondly was how do we shift the narrative around ending mass incarceration? The reality is that you know, there still is a stigma, even within our own faith communities. I mean, we are the people of a second chance, and we still have difficulties kind of with even some of the ways that we talk about this. But we believe that narratives matter. They do change. Um, as much as we'd like to think data changes policy, narrative plays a much stronger role in changing and shifting policy. And so looking at narrative, both in regional and national levels, and then the third is increasing the engagement of faith communities and policy work. So we've been uh, both at the state level and national level. Um, we are trying to support uh, regional work. So in New York, Georgia, Texas, Arkansas, Wisconsin, and Southern California are really places where we are providing more focus. The conference in 2023 will be in January. It'll be at the end of King weekend. So it'll start that Monday and go through Wednesday. And it's going to, it's going to have the flow of both looking at kind of where we've been, what's the snapshot of where things are and where do we need to be going. And so looking at such issues such as restorative justice, um, we've been doing a lot of training and supporting in different regions around um, record restriction events, bailouts, because they bring attention to what the issues are and that then lead to, uh, that hopefully then lead to policy change that happens particularly at the state level. Um, we've got invites out to Brian Stevenson and Stacey Abrams. So our, I mean, obviously Pastor Warnock will be there um, as really the founder uh, or co-founder of this effort. Um, and, you know, our hope is to, our hope is that this will be once again, a launching and a catalyzing opportunity for faith communities partnering um, with, with those that are on the front lines of this work and it is, I think it's really important for us to find ways that we add value to existing work. So we're not really interested in creating, you know, the, the thing, if you will, but how do, we, how do we support what's going on in local communities, like what's going on in Columbus and what's going on in Atlanta and in Savannah and Georgia? Um, so we're, you know, it's in Georgia in particular, we're looking at ways that we can help scale reentry work and increase the engagement of faith communities in reentry work. We're continuing to do trainings with faith communities around record restriction events, bailouts. Um, and we're going to be doing some more training around um, 
around uh, restorative justice. And we're now working with a group called ASO Communications nationally to begin to create messages that we think can shift narrative. So we're test, we're test, we're developing, testing, and then we're going to train faith leaders. And then one of our partners are folks in the music industry. We're working with a group out of Boston called Calling All Crows, which has a number of bands that are part of their um, that are part of their network. And so we want to train musicians, faith leaders in these messages because we are messengers. It's part of what we do. Um, last thing I'll say is one of the places where we found that messaging really counts is, um, I don't know if you remember a lot of the LGBT equality work that was a lot of the referendums that were happening about five to six years ago. And part of what uh, began to help win the day was that in the exit polling, people said, we actually finally heard our faith leaders talking about LGBT equality in a positive way. And so we think that narrative change can make a difference. And we also, um, and that's, it's, it's gotta make a difference externally, but also internally, you know, for our own constituents. So, but anyway, that's, that's the work. Um, I'll put the website in the, I'll put the website in the chat and would be glad to answer any questions. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Pastor. Uh, we have two other folks who have joined us. Uh, so we want to give them an opportunity for a 30 second introduction. Uh, that will be Liz Evans and Cheryl Dersh. So Liz Evans, please introduce yourself. What branch? Liz Evans, are you there? Ah, uh, well, Cheryl Dersh. Yeah, you... I'm here. I'm sorry. If you it's asked me, me I'm on time. a phone call. Sorry, I'll, I'll be back. Ah, uh, who was that talking, Liz Evans, saying she'll be back? No. Oh, well. I was you... saying that I was trying to unmute. Oh. I'm with the Triangle Branch. Of wealth in North Carolina. Yes. Thank you. Uh, and Cheryl Dersh, uh, would you introduce yourself? Um, yes, I'm with the Burlington branch. Um, I, I mean, I feel a little guilty saying I'm with the Burlington branch because I haven't really done anything with them, but I have been working diligently on um, women's incarceration and recently got a, a, a three-year contract with our Department of Corrections to um, create, educate, um, facilitate incarcerated women to be financially independent entrepreneurs and professionals. And um, I just sat in late but heard a lot of your language. Um, uh, excuse me, uh, Cheryl, this was just for you to introduce yourself. Okay. Uh, okay. And so uh, we'll hear from you a little later with uh, more about your work. Uh, so uh, where we are now, uh, Pastor, I think it's important to talk about the work you and I Everyone has to mute yourself if you're not talking. And I'm the only one talking right now. One mic, one mic. Uh, so um, uh, uh, this is the program uh, from the 2019 conference. It is quite important. Uh, I've been getting copies made of the program. And what I want to do is send a copy of this program to all the branches that are involved who were not at the conference in 2019. Uh, I was not at, I was the only person from Columbus, Georgia, 
who attended the conference in 2019. Uh, but since that time, uh, we're working with three different pastors, the largest uh, Black Baptist Church in Columbus is called the Fourth Street Baptist Church. And the senior pastor for there is a part of the conversations uh, that we're having directly with Pastor John Vaughn about work we will be doing in Georgia. Uh, another pastor who's very young and dynamic uh, 31 years old, who is pastor of another large Baptist church. And he's also president of the Interdenominational Ministerial Alliance. Uh, another uh, pastor uh, that I need your help with, Pastor Vaughn, uh, because uh, Sister Monica Spencer has not responded. In addition to the program, there's also a nice resource booklet on expungement, uh, creating expungement events. Uh, in addition to that, there's a huge notebook. Uh, so for a $50 registration fee, those of us who attended got to hear from Michelle Alexander and just dynamic people from around the country. Like Pastor Vaughn said, there were over a thousand people there. I'd never been to anything like it. It was from every faith community and everybody was committed to let my people go. So Pastor Vaughn and the other pastors I mentioned, we have a, a Zoom meeting on March 31st where we're gonna be planning uh, uh, towards uh, the conference in January but we're also going to be planning for the participation of the pastors in facilitating the ending mass incarceration and the death penalty breakouts at the Fannie Lou Hamer Branch Human Rights Conference on December 10th. At our last meeting, uh, sisters and brothers, uh, um, we decided that we would do research in our states to get a picture of mass incarceration in our states. Uh, so that would mean what's going on in Vermont, what's going on in North Carolina, what's going on in Virginia. Uh, and now we know we have Wisconsin. Uh, and so what other states do we have represented here? Uh, Gisela, uh, uh, what state are you in? Remind me, please. Wisconsin. Oh, okay, so Wisconsin. So there are two people here from Wisconsin, uh, Pam and Gisela. Uh, what about you, Liz Evans? What state are you from? Oh, you're from North Carolina. Uh, and Cheryl, you're from Vermont. Uh, so from what I count, we have Georgia, Vermont, North Carolina, Wisconsin, uh, uh, Virginia. Those are the states present on the call today. So uh, let's take a stack for who would like to speak now. Uh, Robin Lloyd, go first, please. Well, um, I'd like to uh, for Cheryl to speak actually because she's been the most active in our community working um, in the prisons and she has a program going and uh, and I also, I, I think she has to leave early. So I just want her to have a voice now. Please, Cheryl, uh, you have three minutes, Cheryl. Okay. Uh, George, do the one minute warning. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so you're looking for a picture of um, incarceration in Vermont. Um, all right, I'll do my best. I'm gonna do it from a women's mother's perspective. Um, that's mostly my focus. So currently Vermont has 6,000 children that have a, um, a parent 
an annual figure of 6,000 children have a um, parent incarcerated or in the criminal justice system. Um, our foster care system grew by 75% in 2015. Um, of the women that got out last year, um, they were released early because of COVID, 10 overdosed and died. Um, we only have 640,000 population in Vermont. Um, we have currently 90 women incarcerated. Before COVID, we had 170. Um, in our class, we have two, we have a 10, 10 student class. Two of the women have been um, brought reincarcerated for 10 times each. I mean, it's just ludicrous. Um, we're focused on um, scaling up the work um, in uh, transitioning into the community. Um, we're focused on um, life skills, finding their values and their purpose very early on in the program. Um, we have I, two women now transitioning out and one of them was only in prison um, for less than three years for something she allegedly did, but they never proved it. Her five-year-old daughter has been taken away, taken away from her permanently. And I did a little research to find out why, and they said her lawyer didn't fight hard enough for her. She had a public defender. 95% of the women in prison had public defenders. Um, Vermont is fifth in the country for taking children away from their parents. Um, is that, that's probably close to three minutes, right? Yes, I think so. Uh, but, uh, yeah. but I guess, I, I just want to say that I really like the idea of changing the narrative. Um, because I, I've, I've come from statistics, as I just showed, I have data. It doesn't, it seems to go numb. You know, I, I think we should be in the fetal position for what's happening to our children and the next generation. Um, because they're seven times more Cheryl, greater of going to prison. Uh, Cheryl, uh, yeah. Cheryl, we're movement building. Uh, so I think even though Vermont is a very white state, my guess is that a significant number of the people who are incarcerated are people of color. Do you have any numbers on the 6,000 children as how many or what percentage of them are children of color? Oops, you're muted now for some reason. Cheryl? You're Can you answer muted. the question? You're muted, Cheryl. Yeah, okay, sorry. You're just trying to unmute. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't have that statistic, but it's something like Vermont has like 1% in its population of people of color or 2%, but, and I'm pulling this out of my hat, I've read it a hundred times, and there's like, representation in prison around six to seven percent of people of color so it's it's a greater imbalance absolutely um, well, i do not you, have any uh, thank you cheryl we need to move on uh um uh uh dear pastor uh you muted yourself Teresa. uh dear pastor I'm not sure how long you could be with us, uh, but the most important thing I think you can help us understand is that uh, the conference in 2019 was to build a movement that is faith-based. However, I was there as a lay person. And when I looked around the room, I didn't notice that there were too many revolutionaries like me there, even though 
in my life, I've always said that Jesus was the first revolutionary. Uh, and so in terms of the work that I do uh, with faith communities, but from the grass roots. So Fam Fanny Luhamer branch is working from the grass roots. And the point I was making to Cheryl is that we must always ask the people of color question because in Idaho, which is a very white state, but when you go to the prisons, you see overwhelmingly indigenous and black and other people of color. So that is the state of mass incarceration. It is a movement against racism and white supremacy. So that's what this subcommittee is identifying. I'm the convener of this subcommittee, which is part of a larger committee called Advancing Human Rights. We also want to end the death penalty. Uh, so those are the two things we're working for as part of a larger national movement. Our uh, Wolf US is a national organization. And I realized I forgot to mention California, which is a serious state because it's a death penalty state. Uh, so we have Vermont, North Carolina, Wisconsin, Georgia, Virginia, uh, and um, California are represented here today. So pastor, could you say what the target states are uh, for the EMI initiative? out of Ebenezer. I thought you mentioned Wisconsin and of course, Georgia. You know, Wisconsin is definitely one of the states. And I think we wanna, we're beginning to build some relationships with some of the faith-based organizing work there. Um, and uh, Arkansas, Texas, Georgia, New York, and Southern California. So I would love to, um, Pamela, are you in Wisconsin? Yes, I am. Um, yeah. So are you with Wis working with Wisdom and Expo and the other groups? Yep. Yeah, yeah, and we have so, done work with them through Peace Action Wisconsin too. Yeah, so I think we've been, you know, been talking with them and trying to figure out what's the best way for us to add value to some of the good work that's going on there. You know, so we've talked about particularly the narrative change training. And so we should have some more and we did it and we've we did a we did a training around record restriction, um, which we'd love to do again. There. Around what? Record restriction. So expungements. So oh, what happens okay. is yeah. See, you know, so how can you, you know, there's a lot of folks who both either have arrest records, but never were you know found of anything, but that follow them, or even in cases where you've actually had you know you've been guilty of something, but you can have your record sealed or expunged that really allows you to, um, it helps you in the job market, it helps you in foster care, it helps you in a number of ways, and it helps reduce recidivism. That is one of our major problems here in Milwaukee is recidivism. It, it's just a revolving door. We have this thing called the Milwaukee Secure Detention Facility. It has no windows. There are sometimes three people in a cell built for one person. And it, it's just horrendous. And we had a big campaign against it. And then um, the leader has moved away and we haven't done anything about it lately, but I would love to get reinvolved in that campaign to close this and change the recidivism. The um, parole system here is terrible. You don't have to commit a crime to be, uh, re you know, to be uh, taken, have your parole taken away yep. or your probation. It, it's, it's insane. It's awful here. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, part of what we're trying to do, Pastor Vaughn, is organize our work as a subcommittee. Uh, clearly, uh, Cheryl has quite a bit going on in uh, Vermont. Uh, so it's my hope that the Vermont branch will develop its own strategy for how to work towards ending mass incarceration in Vermont. Uh, clearly, Pam is already working in Wisconsin. 
so in terms of the target states uh, where we have branches, California is certainly one of those wealth states. Uh, in New York, uh, we're building a branch in New York City. And of course, we have two branches in Georgia, uh, the Metro Atlanta branch and the Fannie Lou Hamer branch. Uh, I do know that we have Melissa Torres uh, in Texas uh, who could help with that. Uh, but what I want to do is mail out all the branches, uh, copies of these two documents as a resource. Uh, so I'm asking Robin Aloy to put uh, a mailing address in the chat because I will mail these two documents uh, to Robin. Uh, so I also need Diane to put her mailing address in the chat because I will mail these two documents to Diane. And Pam, if you could put your mailing address in I'm the chat. I'm going to put uh, Peace Action slash Wilps uh, mailing address because it's good for you to connect with us as an organization. I mean, oh, also, so, Teresa, that you can get electronic copies of at least the expungement guide and the overall toolkit on the website. So if you are more interested in the digital versions, the, the website I put in the chat, endingmassincarceration.com. Oh, um, you know, well, so that, saves, that saves a lot, Pastor. <laughs> That'll <laughs> save you some printing costs. Uh, yeah, let's just go with the digital uh, because our small organization the Southern Anti-Racism Network uh, has been making these copies. And we certainly have plenty of folks in our local branch uh, that we would like to give the hard copies to. Uh, so thank you, pastors. Uh, pastors, so I'll just direct everyone uh, to go to the link that Pastor Vaughn has provided where you can get the expungement a booklet and the other resources that are in the big notebook because there's a big thick notebook with lots of resources in it and it sounds like pastor Vaughn is giving us access uh to the notebook diane blay please um so i'm on your website and i see the expungement toolkit is that what you're talking about and what yes what Okay. That's the expense. That's what I'm talking about. Now, I don't, we may not have the conference. I don't think I don't, we may not have the conference program, but the expansion toolkit and then the faith toolkit, which is the larger toolkit that has all those elements in it. Okay, but and I did see something about the conference, the, the schedule or something I saw on the website too. So. Yeah, I think the schedule is there. It may not be fully everything that was in the book that Teresa has, but you, you know, that conference schedule was, is, is there. Well, that saves a lot, Pastor. Thank you so much. I don't know how I missed it. I haven't been to the website yet. Uh, so now we want to open up the floor uh, to hear from other states uh, that haven't spoken about what's going on in your state. We've heard from Vermont, we've heard from Wisconsin. Uh, 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 Liz, I know the Triangle Branch is very active. Uh, so can you say uh, what's going on in the Triangle Branch uh, with ending mass incarceration? Um, actually, I, I may be re representing that uh, branch, but I'm more interested in taking it to my church because we do have several different kinds of projects involved um, with either helping folks re get reintroduced to um, society or um, just like, for instance, there's something called EENP where folks that are incarcerated help train service dogs so they actually have a job 
that um, where they develop this uh, these service dogs who then are matched with folks um, who have various different kinds of uh, medical disabilities. Um, so there's there's a lot of different organizations. There's another uh, another one that's uh, called Benevolence Farm, which is in um, Alamance County. Uh, it's for women coming out of incarceration and um, it's a residency on a farm, learning work skills, um, developing different kinds of products for sale, um, providing their own income, et cetera. So, um, and, there, and then there's, uh, I think it's restorative justice projects in Durham also. So there's a lot of different aspects of incarceration that my church is involved in. So I'm, I came here pretty much to learn whatever I could learn to take back to them. Certainly I'll share it with my branch as well, but I know that I've got connections that would be very interested in this in my church also. Uh, Liz, what's the name of your church? It's called the Church of Reconciliation. It's Presbyterian. Oh, I know that church well. It is quite famous for the good uh, that it does. We love the Presbyterians, don't we, Pastor? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so uh, that's very good to know. Uh, so I lived in Durham for 12 years. Uh, so that church is in the Triangle, right? Yes. Uh, what what town is it? Chapel Hill. It's Chapel Hill. It's um, on the other. I live in Carborough, so it's way on the other side of Chapel Hill from me. Um, we have folks come uh, that attend that are from Durham and Hillsborough, and you know the areas around, not just Chapel Hill. So. Yeah, I I do recall having been at a program or two there. Uh, before. It's kind of like uh, the community church in Chapel Hill uh, that does a lot of programs. It's the UU church. Uh, right. So the UU in Chapel Hill are also uh, yes. very active on social justice. So I would encourage the North Carolina branches from the Triangle, the Triad, and Southern Piedmont to start working on uh, ending mass incarceration in North Carolina. North Carolina still technically has the death penalty, uh, but there's been a hold on uh, executions for some time. Yes. So this is the way that branches in North Carolina can come together to make a difference. Uh, because one of the other things that we talked about doing at our last meeting uh, is the state of Georgia has uh, banned the box. There are only 14 states in the whole United States that have banned the box. So when you go to try to get a job with the state of Georgia and many of the counties in Georgia, including Muskogee, they do not ask you whether or not you've been arrested or convicted of a crime. Right. And we talked about the possibility of getting that law passed in other states. I think North Carolina still asks the question. Uh, I'm pretty sure Vermont still asks the question. So we're asking people to think of that as a project they can work on. And with three branches in North Carolina, uh, Triangle Triad in Southern Piedmont, that would be a great WILF project. Uh, Robin, you have your hand up. Yeah, sorry, I think I'm afraid I'm, my battery's gonna go out, so I wanna speak now. Um, I think it might be useful to bring uh, Cheryl on and give her a little more time sometime to explain what her project is and how um, how difficult a time she had convincing the authorities to do it and raising the money and everything because it could be replicated 
maybe um, Pastor Vaughn knows about the program and she went to Oregon and saw how they implemented it. So uh, I think, uh, you know, she could share her, her uh, experience, her narrative of making this happen. Uh, it might be useful for others in the future. Uh, well, we all have a lot of things going on in our states that are useful. What Cheryl is doing is service providing. Uh, yeah. and there are lots of services being provided, but this subcommittee is set up for social change. Mm. How do we actually end mass incarceration? That is not work that Cheryl is doing. Uh, but I think it might be helpful in Vermont uh, for the Vermont branch uh, to work with Cheryl on how that work can be improved at the state level. Uh, but as you know, we have a one hour meeting and our meeting is about ending mass incarceration and the death penalty, which overwhelmingly impacts people of color. And as Cheryl pointed out, there are very low numbers of people of color in Vermont. Uh, so the one thing uh, that we like to do at the end of our meeting, uh, we have, uh, George, are you helping us with the time? Do we have what I see? It looks like 10 minutes remaining. That's right. For our meeting. And Amani so, joined us. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Uh, well, Amani, if you could come on camera and introduce yourself. Uh, because you're part of the new Southern Piedmont branch. Uh, so please come on and introduce yourself, Imani. Yes, hello. My name is Imani Floyd. Um, I'm currently at the NC Center for Diversity and Inclusion, where my organization that I'm primarily involved with, the Freedom Center, is located um, here in Charlotte, North Carolina. So I am happily involved in the new branch that has been formed, Southern Piedmont, I believe we're called. So very excited to be here and I'm sorry I was not able to attend the majority of this meeting. I definitely had some feedback and things that I wanted to contribute, but I'm happy to be here to get the tail end of things. Uh, well, thank you, Imani. Are you a student? No, ma'am. <laughs> I, I'm oh. not a student. I'm, I'm 24. So oh, I, yeah. I graduated uh, two years okay. ago from UNC Greensboro. Oh, That's wonderful. Funny. Thank you. UNC Greensboro, we love Greensboro. Yes. Uh, so, um, so Pastor, uh, we want to leave any final words you have uh, for us to give us direct. So, Teresa, I think I lost you. I think I lost you. Oh, can you can, yeah, my connection was a little unstable yeah. for a moment. So I'm going to turn off my camera uh, so you can give us the final word before we determine when our next meeting is. Thank you. Well, I, well, I just want to thank you all for inviting me to participate. And I'm, you know, I'm really eager to, however, that we can help support the range of efforts, you know, that we've talked about, you know, because I think it's what I've learned in this work is we have to be involved in the service and the advocacy part of it, you know, because people who are directly impacted have said to us, look, if you're not dealing with the service and the advocacy, then, you know, you're not going to, it's not going to make sense for us. Like we've really got to, we've got to hold those two. And so, However that we can be, I mean, hopefully there'll be some trainings we're going to be doing, uh, you know, around some of the narrative change work. We'd love to pull you all into that. If there are ways that we can be supportive of some of the work that you have going, you know, that's great. And, and I hope that you'll put the, the, the uh, conference on your calendar. And when you get your save the date, you'll pass it along to others within your communities. 
Well, uh, does anyone have a question uh, for Pastor Vaughn before we pick our uh, date for our meeting in April? A quick question. Have you heard of um, All of Us or None in Wisconsin, that prison movement? I have, absolutely. Oh, all right. Big part and of black the, and I, pink? I say back, back in my, so back in my funding days, actually back when I was at Peace Development Fund, we actually funded, we did the initial grant for all of us or none of us when they were getting oh, started. Oh, thank you. <laughs> the great group. Okay. Yeah, they are. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, well, uh, we tend to meet on Monday afternoons at 2 p.m. Uh, so in looking at the calendar for April, uh, April 11th uh, is showing up as a, really good day for me. Uh, so can people check their calendars to see if they're available Monday, April 11th at 2 p.m. Eastern time, uh, which would be 11 a.m. California time and 1 p.m. Wisconsin time. Everybody's okay, Pam is okay. Are you okay, Imani? Uh, Diane is okay. Uh, so is there anyone not okay? Uh, well, uh, then we'll end our meeting uh, by securing Monday, April 11th at um, the times I mentioned, 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, and uh, we may have a different guest speaker on that date. Uh, there is someone who has stood very strong uh, for the, uh, uh, against the death penalty. He's a Catholic worker and he recently got out of prison uh, for standing up to nuclear weapons. Uh, his name is Patrick O'Neill and he lives in Garner, North Carolina. So Liz knows my good friend, Patrick. Uh, by the way, Patrick has agreed to speak on nuclear weapons at the uh, Fannie Lou Hamer Branch Human Rights Conference, which will be in Atlanta, hopefully, on December 10th. So mark your calendar for that day because Patrick O'Neill, he wrote the most beautiful uh, uh, letter from prison. Uh, he was in a federal prison and he told about all of the black men in the prison with him and how they made sure that he didn't sit in the wrong place or whatever. And his letter is absolutely beautiful. So George, uh, I think I sent you the letter uh, could you share it with everyone who's in the meeting today uh, that Patrick O'Neill wrote that letter. Uh, so we will ask him uh, to speak to us uh, about uh, his time in prison and what he observed uh, as well as his work around the death penalty. If there are no objections, I will ask Patrick O'Neill to be our speaker next month. Well, great. I think we're all set. Uh, we have three minutes to spare. Uh, anybody have any burning last words? <laughs> I have it for Zoom. Bye. Oh, Imani, <laughs> were you saying something? Yes, I wanted to share briefly about something that I learned at the White Privilege Conference this past week in Charlotte. Um, that was about the story of Keith Lamar and the campaign, which is called Justice for Keith Lamar. Um, his website is www.keithlamar.org, um, which I'm sure I can write down and get distributed out somewhere. But he's currently on the death penalty. Uh, he's currently on death row right now and set to be executed, wrongfully executed, in November of next year. And um, I was just extremely moved and touched by his story. They actually had him call from prison to talk a little bit about the charges that he's been given and just his whole experience with the justice system. He's been wrongfully accused of crimes committed during the 1993 Lucasville prison uprising and um, his story.
story is incredibly powerful. He has a book and he also has a number of petitions which you can shine, you can sign um, online and also share around on your social media platforms if you want to uh, get this man wrongfully um, convicted off of death row right now. Um, he's a black man, of course. And um, as we know, and I'm sure we've already discussed plenty in this conversation, they are disproportionately impacted by the death row and mass incarceration. Um, left and right. And he's currently being held in Ohio for anybody who's in that area. Imani, if you send me information, I can email it to the folks on this list, just as I will the letter from Patrick O'Neill. Okay. Is that in any, um, yeah, of some digital form that I can email to people? Yes, I will. I know your hand is up, Diane, but it's 259. Go ahead. I was just adding to that, that the free Keith Lamar petition is at the Action uh, Network. Are sponsoring it right now? Thank you, Diane. Appreciate it. Uh, well, have a good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and thanks so much for attending. Uh, George, uh, save the recording so it can go out uh, to the branches list. Yes, uh, ma'am. It was very important information. And we do want a big crowd next month uh, for Patrick O'Neill. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.